Ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce Miss Anne Darrow, the bravest girl I have ever known. There the beast and here the beauty. She has lived through an experience no other woman ever dreamed of. The experience of talking about King Kong 2005, because this week's episode of Geek History Lesson on King Kong is now in session. Hello and welcome to Geek History Lesson. I am Jason, sometimes once a banana, Inman. I am Ashley Victoria Robinson. Welcome to your Mind University because you have stumbled onto the podcast where we discuss one character, comic, or giant ape from popular culture and teach you everything you need to know about it in about an hour. Yeah, we are right in the midst of a battle royale between monsters of Kong versus Godzilla, Godzilla versus Kong. Uh, I'm going to say because you reference another famous Japanese property, Battle Royale, that your Godzilla bias is showing. I'm all Kong all the way. <laughs> I'm just, I am hashtag Ting Kong, and that is the reason why this week we are talking about King Kong. Now, to change it up a little bit, last week we we sort of explained uh, the history of Godzilla movies and certain Godzilla movies with a great Godzilla comic book writer, Eric Burdum. This week we decided to go back to another luminary director's look at a Kong movie. Peter Jackson, Oscar-winning director of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, Peter Jackson made a King Kong movie in 2005, and that is the the basis we're going to talk about because I think if you were to ask most people, and we didn't poll anybody for this, and that's our, our, that's our bad, sorry, but <laughs> I think most people would say this is the best Kong movie ever made. Now, the, a lot, I know a lot of people just threw popcorn at their speakers. I'm sorry, but I'm putting it down there. This was made by an Oscar winner. Just go with it. All right. <laughs> yes. And you just heard that little, <sighs> that is because we have a special guest here. We have a special guest of Mr. Jeremy Skinner, straight beaming in live from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Mr. Jeremy Skinner, welcome to this episode of Geek History Lesson. Hello. I'm sorry I sighed so audibly. No, it's all good. It was a perfect <laughs> segue into this. Now, everybody out there, you might remember Jeremy from our HBO Watchmen discussion. You might uh, have heard him being mentioned several times uh, for, as uh, Jeremy is, is my best friend. So we bring him on. I love chatting with him. Also, Jeremy is also the co-host of a brand new podcast, Jason and Jeremy John, about Justice League over at patreon.com slash Jawin, J-W-I-I-N. Uh, Jeremy, tell us a little bit about your new podcast. Uh, yeah, so Jason and Jeremy John about Justice League is a podcast starring two best friends. That's me and you. And what an we... original concept. <laughs> there are no other podcasts out there with two friends no, talking about it. And none with couples either. Definitely not. <laughs> nope, it's not a thing. We're really trailblazing and groundbreaking here. Um, but we watch Justice League, the animated series. Yes. Uh, we we want to make it clear. It's the animated end. series. We don't just put Zack Snyder's Justice League on repeat. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Although I watched it twice. That was good enough. Thank I, you. I, I'm throwing out some gold there. Somebody could do that once a month. Do you just rewatch Zack Snyder's Justice League? Record an episode. Throw it out there. Throw it out there. Um... <laughs> I'll do that one time. <laughs> um, I'd love to throw some additional kudos on Jeremy because he is also very much the lifeblood of our Patreon Discord community. That is correct. So oh, everyone who's you. over there, I know, uh, knows and loves Jeremy. And he does a lot of heavy lifting for Jason and I <laughs> on the Discord side, including things like explaining how Discord works. So <laughs> much respect. Yes, there's a lot of, if you go if you go over to the Patreon Discord, a lot of it is me personally tagging Jeremy and asking, hey, how does this work? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know Discord. Um, but Well, Discord uh, <laughs> is easy when you have a great fan base like you guys have. And we do. And we and we and, and you're part of that. And everybody listening is part of that. Uh, but uh, if you want to check out uh, Jer Jason and Jeremy John about Justice League, it's over at Patreon.com slash John. I guarantee you, you're going to hear some sound effects because we love segments on that podcast like this. Oh, didn't mean that one. See, we're already messing up. This, this, <laughs> this is like a Jason and Jeremy John about Justice League episode already. Oh, my God. There's there's segments, more segments, and then more segments that we haven't even done yet. There it is. Segments <laughs> on segments on segments. <laughs> All right. So let's get into the main meat of this lesson, talking about King Kong of 2005. Let's go to the 10 cent origin of this movie. Um, 
Real quick, the synopsis of this film is a greedy film producer assembles a team of movie makers and sets out for the infamous Skull Island where they find more than just cannibalistic natives. This movie was released on December 14th, 2005, and it has a running time of 187 <coughs> minutes, the theatrical version. It uh, is, of course, had a budget of $207 million. Its box office was $562 million. I'm unsure if that's international or domestic. Directed by Peter Jackson. Screenplay by Fran Walsh, Philippa Boyens, and Peter Jackson, the Lord of the Rings team, the Oscar-winning screenplay team. It, of course, is based on the original King Kong film, from, I believe, uh, and Jeremy, please correct me on this because you said you watched it, 1933? That is correct. Uh, that was by James Krillman, Ruth Rose, Edgar Wallace, and Marion C. Cooper, who we definitely should give credit to since this movie mm -hmm. takes a lot of their ideas and sort of remixes them. Uh, this movie stars Andy Serkis, Naomi Watts, Jack Block, Adrian Brody, Thomas Kirchman, Colin Hanks, Jamie Bell, Evan Park, Lobo Chan, and Kyle Chandler, among many others. Okay, let's get to the meet cute. Ashley, what's the meet cute? The meet cute is the second part of the podcast where we stole a term for romantic comedy writing, where we tell you where we first meeted these characters and how cute it was. Uh, Jeremy, where did you first see King Kong 2005? Uh, I saw this in theaters when it came out. And you said you, okay, you watched King Kong 1933 this week, correct? Yes, yeah. I um after I had seen it like I don't even think I ever saw it all the way through, to be honest, but I had remember seeing bits and pieces of it whenever I was a kid on AMC or Turner Classic Movies, back when AMC actually showed old movies. Um Yeah, with the original <laughs> the, the original purpose of that channel. <laughs> yes. Um so I I had seen part of it then, but yeah, I, I rewatched the original after doing this too, uh, just because I was I was curious about how much of this movie's DNA came from the original and um, almost all of it <laughs> really <laughs> well it's so interesting so Jeremy I'm exactly like you I ha saw the original black and white King Kong a long time ago when I was a kid just on a Sunday or a Saturday afternoon and then I saw King Kong in theaters as well um, so it was like a Christmas movie for me so Ashley um, I believe you saw King Kong 2005 for the very first time this week. Yeah, so I first met Peter Jackson in 2017 after William Bibiani sent me an email. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me pick up those names. Yeah, holy cow. <laughs> that is a true story, though. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. I think we have a sound effect for a name drop. There it is. <laughs> Man, Justice League really is bleeding into here now. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I first watched King Kong 2005 on Wednesday when uh, we were going to wait till 8 o'clock, and then Jason said, it's 6 o'clock, can we just start this movie now? It's three and a half hours late. I, I forgot. <laughs> I forgot how long this movie was. I, I thought it was like a clean 30 minutes, and then I looked it up, and I was like, oh, no, it's like three hours and 20. Yeah, <laughs> Let me yeah. say, we, we both watched the extended cut, though. The theatrical cut is like three hours, seven minutes. Oh, I'm, I'm pretty certain we... I think we watched the theatrical cut. So did you see know. did you see a scene with the river monster attacking them? No. Okay, that's the theatrical cut. I watched the extended cut. Oh, then. okay, Jeremy, then this is great. This is excellent because then you can pick up and be if we move past a certain point, you can talk about whether you think the extended cut was better in certain scenes or not as good. Or if you're like, oh, that I'm glad they cut that out. I, I as, as far as I'm aware, that one scene is the only real addition to it. <laughs> what? Um, <laughs> and, and, and as far, I mean, I'm sure some mo little moments are extended, but not having watched them side by side and not having seen this movie since 2005, I, I couldn't begin to tell you <laughs> what they were, unfortunately. I so had, I don't rely too heavily on me as a resource in that regard. Right. I had not seen this movie in, Intel about the 19, actually the 1930s, excuse me. I'm, I'm, I'm literally staring. I haven't, yeah, I'm. Jason's 100. It was one of the first talkies, see? <laughs> it was pre code, baby. I, I this up, was pre code. Yeah, I know. I, I picked up my soup and my, my bread and I walked into the talkie <laughs> box. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, though, the first place I heard about King Kong, though, was the Simpsons episode, the King Homer parody. Oh, yes, oh. the Treehouse of Horror. Yeah, Treehouse of Season four, episode five. Yes. Okay. Let's get into talking about this movie, the main discussion. Of course, there will be spoilers for this 2005 film. Um, we, I want to start this off 
basically because we have to acknowledge that this is Peter Jackson's blank check movie. Now, if you don't know what I mean by the term of blank check, uh, there's a very fa- there's an excellent podcast actually out there called Blank Check with uh, David and Griffin, where they sort of talk about this feature. It's the idea that after the Lord of the Rings, um, New Line gave, and I believe Universal, I can't remember who also distributed Lord of the Rings. Uh, I think Warner Brothers. They gave Peter Jackson a blank check to basically make any movie he wanted, and he chose King Kong. It's his favorite movie. Because it's his favorite movie of all time. And here, and you can, this I think will make a lot of things clear for viewers. If you watch this movie and you're like, ah, there's some weird things in this. I don't know if I like the POV, because I do believe that Peter Jackson's King Kong has some weird POV choices. But that's because Peter Jackson sides with Kong. He actually said (laughs) that when he was, uh, nine years old and he saw the 1933 film he cried when kong falls off the empire state building so peter jackson is a gorilla lover i'm just gonna put that out there he loves the apes what's wrong with that no it's not wrong (laughs) i'm a gorilla lover too (laughs) i am king kong i did say that but it's but it is interesting because king kong destroys a lot of new york but also he shouldn't have been there but i think that's an interesting lens to look at this movie that this was his dream movie which is a lot of things that like a lot of people we don't get that opportunity i mean like ashley okay let me uh, i'm gonna put you on the spot right now and jeremy you're gonna be on the spot in just a second w- warner brothers comes to you and says ashley mm-hmm. you can remake any old movie you want your vision we will not give you any notes it's all yours what old movie do you remake I would have said Creature from the Black Lagoon for oh. a really long time. Oh. I really like Creature from the Black Lagoon. I rewatched it again the last October. Um, but I think uh, GDT has me beat in terms of what there is to say about that and as a twist on that story. Um, King Kong is a really good choice. Right now, I would probably ask for uh, The Wolfman. Oh, good choice. And I would want to do a werewolf movie with a female lead, something like a good Canadian feature, Ginger Snaps, but for a more contemporary sensibility. Or I would pick Dracula um, because, Jason, you and I have talked about this for a long oh, time. Yeah. There's a lot of um, sexual assault overtones a in, ground. in vampires. In vampire meat. And so what about if you flipped that and we put like a, a wife of Dracula in power? So I, I think there's some, I think the OG monster movies have a lot of good stuff to mine. I really do. Jeremy, Warner Brothers comes to you, says they're giving you a blank check to remake any old movie. What are you making? Any old movie, it doesn't have to be a creature feature. Doesn't have to be a creature feature. I mean, so for me, the challenge of that is like, you don't want to, I don't want to pick anything I like because I'm not, I don't (laughs) trust myself to do better than, than that, you know? So I would want to pick something that I think was like a good idea or had a good tone, but maybe just something was off in the execution. And first thought, best thought, the 1994 movie, The Shadow. Oh! With Alec Baldwin. That definitely needs a remake. Yes. I, I really, really liked that movie when I was a kid so much. And like, I I watched it maybe five years ago and it didn't hold up that great. No, it doesn't. And like, you could like keep it period, make another period version of it that it has a slightly different tone and you can pull it off. You know, it's my choice has always been, it, it is a movie I like, Highlander. Ooh, I would remake that's Highlander. A good I've one. wanted to remake Highlander for so long. I know, start a new franchise yep, with that. Yes, I've o- I've always had this idea. Like I'm throwing out there, Hollywood. Um, I have I have a take on Highlander that I think would be really would set it up for a perfect trilogy, all based around Connor McCloud. Jason also has a great pitch for a um, Conan movie as well. <laughs> mm, I do. So is let Christopher him do Lambert Conan. still alive? Uh, yes, he is. Yeah, he was on Ooh. Arrow. Was he not? Uh, he was on yeah. Arrow. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was. So. All with, right, with but his, this is not the Arrow. You could redo, you could redo <laughs> Highlander, but have him in the Sean Connery role now. Um, look, I love Chris or Lambert. This is not the Highlander podcast, but um, <laughs> he can have a cameo. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna give that part to. You know, some Ian McKellen or somebody like that. That's what we're going to do. Ooh. Yeah. I don't know. Anyways, let's talk about King Kong. <laughs> Ian McKellen isn't in King Kong. Yes, but Ian McKellen is in the shadow. 
Is he really? Bringing back the oh, Peter yeah. Jackson connection. <laughs> that's right, yes. So, yeah, he is like a goofy scientist in the shadow. Oh, that's wild. So well done for that segue, Jeremy. <laughs> um, okay, so this movie, of course, is set in 1933, uh, which is a really great choice. The year that the movie came out, we're at the height of the, dark, the, the Great Depression, and we spend a lot of the beginning of this movie showing how uh, New York City looks during the Depression. And I actually thought... Uh, sort of the sepia sort of look of this movie. One, I'm going to say this, and I need to give the shout out right out the gate because I thought, and this is the same um, cinematographer from Lord of the Rings, Andrew Lesney. He won the Oscar for Lord of the Rings. I think this movie looks gorgeous. And mm-hmm. I think I think with the exception of some wonky CGI here and there, but which nobody can can get around. Your CGI is always going to age. You can't change that. But I think this movie, from lighting and color tones and everything, looks great for a 15-year-old movie. I think it looks really good. And I was actually surprised at how cool this sort of CGI old-timey New York still looked. So I really enjoyed that. Um Ashley, I'd love to hear your choice as the person that is coming to this movie the freshest. Mm -hmm. What did you think about them sort of grounding and starting this movie with actress Anne Darrow, played by Naomi Watts, and meeting kind of who is obviously supposed to be an Orson Welles impression, uh, Carl Denham, played by Jack Black. We're, We're starting this monster movie right in Hollywood, sort of, even though it's set in New York. So, one, Jack Black, particularly, this is Jack Black... At the height of his Hollywood hotness. Jack Black does not get enough credit. I'm going to say this for how like straight up hot he is. He's so cute in this movie. He's so attractive in this movie. I was like, damn, Jack Black is hot. Um, I do not. He's a babe. He is. And he seems like a nice man. Please, yeah. Jack Black, come on our podcast. Open invitation. We'd have. I, you know what? I would do. The, <laughs> I, I will. I will say this right now. <laughs> I watched your um, HBO show last year. Come uh, on. <laughs> we did. Yeah, we did. Um. I would a hundred percent do a tenacious D in the Pick of Destiny episode if we sure. could get Jack Black. Oh. I would. I would do it if we could get Kyle. Kyle Gass. You think we could get one of them or Meatloaf? You know, I think we actually have a connection to Jack Black. I do. I think we do. <laughs> okay. I, I actually think we are w- within six degrees of Jack Black. Okay. So. Well, hold hold out. People start tweeting at start Jack tweeting Black. Tell or them Kyle. Come. Tweet at Kyle. Tell, tell them to come on the show. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I do not like starting in Hollywood slash New York because it's actually New York. Oh, why? I don't like movies about movies or stories about Hollywood. Like, it's just not. Or stories about stories. It's not my jam, mm. man. Um, and the most interesting thing about this movie all happens when they leave New York. And New York Island. is, as a scientific fact, the greatest city in the world. So, like, I have no problem with them being in New York, but I, I don't think we Hot need to Hot take by it. Ashley Victoria Robinson right there. Uh, yes, thank you, Lin-Manuel Miranda, for that. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, there's some interesting things here. I like seeing the vaudeville act. I think Naomi Watts is actually doing a lot of the dancing and the acrobatics. Yeah, I think um, she is. Which is really impressive, so, like, absolute props to her. But I was like, I don't care about this playwright. I don't care that she's not famous. Like, just get on the effing boat and leave already. I want some big dumb monsters. Uh, Jeremy, how did you feel about the whole sort of starting with the the Hollywood director and sort of this actress that has not made it yet. I I, I actually really disagree with Ashley. How uh, dare um, you? <laughs> this is the internet. <laughs> um, for, for one thing, Carl Denham in this version of King Kong is a much more interesting character than he is in the original. What was he like in the original from um, the person who has seen it the most? He's, recently? he's, I would say that Jack Black is low key, the antagonist of this movie. Oh, hundred really. percent. Yeah. yeah. 100%. And, and, and that's less of a vibe that like happens in the original. I think it's more, the original kind of gives off a little bit more of like a, what hath God wrought thing. Um, By the way, I meant to tell you both and I forgot this, but my opening intro is a line of dialogue from, um, the original 1933 King Kong. Oh, nice. Yes. Yeah. So, sorry to interrupt you, Jared. No, no, you're fine. Um, but so I, I like the New York stuff because, like, it really helped flesh out Denim's character. And unlike Ashley, I do like movies about movies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I think it works really well here. And I also think that 
um, showing Naomi Watts doing her vaudeville routine at the beginning of it really helps establish why her and Kong have a relationship. It's a key moment you know, between them later on. Um, And there is nothing like that. And Darrow is so thinly drawn in the original King Kong. Um, You know, Fay Ray is great. Um, No shade thrown on her, but she's, she's not written with very much to do except fall in love with the first mate and scream. Uh, Jeremy, you're saying a woman was hardly ever um, was not very, I think a complex character in a 1933 movie. Shocking. Can you Shocking. imagine? Can you even imagine? <laughs> How that, I, that, I don't believe you. Um, <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I think this movie starts out in such a, um, in such a Hollywood basis because of Peter Jackson, because this, there is a lot of Peter Jackson in Jack Black. Yes. Well, yeah. because, because this, this is a love letter for Peter oh, Jackson. hundred mm-hmm. percent. And mm-hmm. that's why I think, that's why I think this is about a film director and an yes. actress and it's all, and there's a, pl- like a playwright, a director and an actress. Walk are into th- a bar. Are the three main characters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now walk onto an island and fight a monkey. That's what, you know, that's what He's they an do. He's an ape. He's a great ape. It's funnier to call him There's a only three in the world. Look, I'm Team Kong. I can call him whatever I want. Okay. <laughs> um, speaking of calling whoever I want to, I want, I want to call out James Newton Howard, the composer of this film. I love the score to 2005's King Kong. I think it's amazing. Uh, I think it's really strong. There's an amazing uh, theme for Andero, and there's an amazing Kong theme that I think is really good. And fun fact, little scuttlebutt, um, Howard Shore was the original composer of this movie. Hot off his Oscar wins for the Lord of the Rings trilogy. For Lord of the Rings as well. And he even has a cameo in this movie. Holy crap, I did not know that. Jeremy, where is his cameo? He is the conductor that leads the orchestra whenever uh, they display Kong to the world at the end. Oh, that's cool. I did not know that. Now, Mm -hmm. here's the thing. Howard Shore, and I did some research on this, could not find a conclusive answer anywhere. There are rumors that Howard Shore was fired, and he was let go from this movie eight weeks before it opened. Yeah. Yeah. Eight weeks. And if people aren't necessarily as familiar with the filmmaking process, that is cutting it real freaking close. Yes. Real close. It, yeah. Very close. I, I bet you they had a fi- they had a locked cut oh, for at sure. that point. But yeah, score is usually like one of the last things. That is really close to releasing this movie. And some rumors say that the studio didn't like his score. Some rumors say that Peter Jackson and Howard Shore did not get along. Um Nobody quite knows for sure. It obviously wasn't that bad because Howard Shore joined Peter Jackson on the Hobbit film. So obviously they, they, they didn't end up hating each other because of King they, Kong. Or they yeah. sometime passed and they worked it out, which we also love. I also tried to find Howard Shore's score. Mm-hmm. Could not find it anywhere. But people say that apparently like Howard Shore has saved all the files and he's like crossing his fingers that 20 years down the row we can do like an... The shortcut. Release the shortcut. Release the shortcut, <laughs> yes. Um, she beat me there by yeah. just a second. It's just because <laughs> you, you got in yeah. it delay. So. But <laughs> With that being said, I actually do love James Newton Howard's score. And the fact that he was able to come up with this in less than eight weeks, I think is astounding. Yeah, it's yeah. wild because I believe most composers compose somewhere between like one and five bars of music um, in a day. A bar of music, if you're literally looking at the sheet music, is between the two large lines. It's not very much. It's sometimes maybe a couple seconds. So the idea that he would be able to score an hours long movie in that time, like the amount of writing and how quickly it would have had to come together is astronomical from a composition point of view. So these characters all run towards the boat because we find that Jack Black, of course, is scheming and he's still in film and he's going to places. And we basically get dumped into a sequence where we almost meet our entire cast because we get to the boat. We we get a brief uh, idea where Adrian Brody as Jack Driscoll, a famous playwright, gets stuck on the boat. He has a great line of dialogue where he says to Carl Denham, I've never known you to volunteer cash before. I really love that line. And then at the end of it where he gets trapped on the boat, Jack Black replies to him, if you really love the theater, you would have jumped. Some really, really solid dialogue in this. We get Kyle Chandler, as I like to call him, the Dame Tamer, which is one of his fake posters that he has in his thing. It's a, there was actually a movie in their universe called The Dame Tamer. Um, he's actually Bruce Baxter, which is a really great choice. Andy Circus as Lumpy. Um, 
Jamie Bell shows up, which I was, I completely forgot Jimmy Bell as Jimmy. Um, let me ask you this. Is there anybody out of this? Evan Parks as Hayes. I forgot to mention him as well. Colin Hanks is in this movie as Preston, uh, Jack Black's assistant. Is there any of, of these supporting cast members? Because to me, this really is, even though Adrian Brody is like set up as like the romantic male lead, I really do feel that this whole movie is sort of a take a pull and push and pull between Jack Black's character and Naomi Watts character really back. And it's kind of their two movies. And then Kong's in the middle um, of all the other characters I mentioned, Jeremy, we can start with you. Do any of them stand out for you or any of them? Like you're like, Oh, I enjoyed their performance throughout most of the movie. I'll, I'll say this. Adrian Brody is the weak link in this cast. I agree. Like almost everybody else is is pretty well cast and like whether or not you like people's stories they're given time um i think this movie is balanced pretty well between the amount of characters it's trying to juggle i think it could have juggled a couple less and it would have been fine i agree with that as well um but i i think it does a really good job with most of the characters um i don't want to you know like get ahead of myself you know in terms of who's the best performance in it oh we're gonna say that till the end yeah but but i think that almost everybody really does a a good job and adrian brody is not a bad actor i think he also just doesn't have a tremendous amount to work with he's got one scene towards the end that's truly dumb as well so well we have to point out as well that we mentioned that this was like sort of the Hollywood goes through these cycles, right, where they get obsessed with an actor or an actress, and they're suddenly in a million movies. Um, this was that same time for Adrian Brody. Like, Adrian Brody was in a million movies around this time because he was the Hollywood... So It's weird that he sort of... Because I always thought he was a great character actor, and then he started being, like, the leading man in a bunch of well, stuff. Well, he won the Academy Award for the for piano. The piano yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ashley, or the pianist, rather. Yes, yeah. the pianist. Ashley, is any of these uh, supporting characters or secondary characters really stand out to you? Uh, well, I'm not going to say anything more about Halle Berry's Assaulter, because I don't think it's worth my time or my energy. Um, oh. I Yeah, that's, that's my other hot take. I think... Um, Peter Jackson is obviously most famous for uh, telling a story through a movie about nine to 15 characters, depending on whether or not you want to upgrade like Aomer and Eowyn and Faramir and Arwen to co-leads or not. Are you saying that he basically <laughs> made the fellowship of the boat? I'm saying if you watch this knowing that it comes smack dab between the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit, most of the things that happen in this movie can be explained. That's true. That's true. <laughs> um, I do think it is too many characters. Um, Evan Park as Hayes is so good. Mm -hmm. Like, so, so good. And he is bringing, like, a lot of weight and gravitas to this that not everybody else in the cast is doing. Um, recently, recent star of Picard. I was just, I was going to say yeah. that to Jeremy. I was going to say, yeah, did you know, I did not recognize him until Ashley started looking through his IMDb, but most people... Recently, you would recognize Evan Park because he plays uh, Tenkem Adrev, who is the black Romulan that challenges Captain Picard to a sword fight, I think in episode four or five of Picard season one. Yeah, that's right. But I love his arc with Jamie Bell as Jimmy, but they they kind of never pay off Jimmy, no, in don't. my opinion, nope. because they're like, oh, he's this castaway and we don't really know where he came from. And you see a lot of characters like emotionally invested in his like development and like what he's interested in. And then they tell this bizarre story about a castaway that they picked up who told them about the island and then killed himself, which seems to imply that Jamie Bell might have been part of that or that maybe he also knows the like it's very strange that Billy Elliot is going on this journey, but I like him. So I didn't mind it. <laughs> Action figure spotlight. Well, I crazy <laughs> crackpot <What>? theory spotlight. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was really hoping there was a Jamie they Bell. They made a Jamie <laughs> Bell toy? <laughs> I wish. There's probably one from Fantastic Four. We only have so many sound effects, everybody. Okay. <laughs> um, my crackpot theory for Jimmy, Jamie Bell, because you are correct. They never pay that off. No. Here is my insane theory. Jamie Bell, Jimmy is the son of Kong. He is Diddy. He's Diddy Prince Prince Diddy Kong is Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> Also, Kyle Chandler is, like, way too good for this part. Uh, Kyle, uh, Kyle Chandler uh, is is perfectly cast in this part because... I know, but Kyle Chandler should have been, like, the the, the lead of something. You know what I mean? Like, Kyle having Ch him as a supporting is so strange. Kyle Chandler should have been Jack Driscoll. 
is who he should have been in this movie. Mm-hmm. He yes, sh- he, yes. He, 20 out of 10. He should, he should have been Jack Driscoll. That's to me is, because I agree with you, Jeremy, Adrian Brody feels way out of place in this movie. Yeah. He does not fit in with the rest of the crew who are all sort of, even Naomi Watts, all, every actor in this movie, it, with the exception of Adrian Brody, is putting a, a, a layer of cheese on top of everything. They're and, all living in the same reality. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and mm-hmm. it's because we are, we know that we're in this weird, bright Hollywood monster movie. And Adrian Brody is just playing Adrian Brody. And that's why he sticks out like a sore thumb. You're, you're hundred percent right. That's exactly what's going on here. So everybody, we got to talk about, I think probably the most important question in this movie. So, they get on the boat. They leave New York. They leave New York City in a boat. The greatest city in the world. Okay. To go to Skull Island. Oh, my God. Jason brought this up during the movie. Yep. <laughs> so Skull Island is in the Atlantic? Is that? The, that's what this movie is telling us. Skull Island is in the Atlantic somewhere. <laughs> now, based on the impression of this movie, it really feels like Peter Jackson is leaning into that Skull Island might be near the Bermuda Triangle kind of an idea. Jeremy, I wanted to ask you, since you saw the the 1933 movie, the most recent, do they give you any indication where Kong's Island is in that movie? I, like, I about the same level that they do in this movie. So yeah, like somewhere in the Bermuda Triangle kind of feels right. All right, let me ask you personally. I think Skull Island should be in the Pacific. I... I would think that as well, but yeah, we are well established as departing from New York yeah, multiple New, times. So yeah, New York City <laughs> is the thing because like you're like, there's no way you guys went to the Panama Canal, or if you would, yeah. you probably would have shown that scene. And if that's the case, why didn't you take a train to L.A. or San Francisco hmm. or something like that? That bothered me because I was like, yeah, like what is the deal here? Now we also have to talk about before we get past the crew and before we even get to Skull Island. What do we think about Kyle Chandler, Ashley? Mm. Kyle Chandler is in this King Kong movie. He's also in uh, Godzilla, yes. King of Monsters. Yes. And he's confirmed he's in Godzilla versus Kong. Yes. Oh, crap. He is, yeah. isn't he? He is crossed over. He has been in both sides of the Kong versus Godzilla debate. Um, I mean, I'm pro Kyle Chandler, so like putting him in anything uh, is a big plus for me. I don't know him from that football show that everybody else knows him Friday from. Friday Night Lights. Uh, thank you. Friday Night Lights. Um, but I mean, he's he plays a character named Mark Russell. Dr. Famed Mark Russell. comic book writer Mark Russell, played by Kyle Chandler. Yeah. Well, he probably got tomorrow's copy of Variety early and ha! saw that he had been cast in it wow, and, really and then called his agent was like, give me that part. I love that we brought in an early edition joke into this episode. That's what I know him from. That's what so. I know him from. That was the first thing that I ever knew him from as well was early edition. I huh? know him from Bloodlines, um, which uh, April Cooter, uh, wife of Aaron Cooter, mm-hmm. comic book artist, told me I had to watch and she was correct. <laughs> All right. So we get to Skull Island. Um, there's a big wall around the island. There's some fog. There's um, some people in blackface. Yes, we- when when Jason and I watched this, there was a sensitivity warning about blackface, which my brain said, okay, it's the 30s. We're probably going to see elements of a minstrel show on stage. But nope, they're fully just painted some of these nice native to the region they were shooting in folks even darker which i know 2005 was a different moral compass but i was a little shocked by personally well i was surprised i actually appreciated that before we watched the amazon movie that they gave us the warning because Mm -hmm. when you watch this movie in hd and to be honest with you i think this is the first time i've seen this movie in hd it is very apparent that they are in my face, like right out the gate. Now, I do think that there probably are some. There are some actual uh, black people. Yes. Or, yeah, yes. for sure. But there are other people that you can clearly tell have been painted mm-hmm. to be, um, you know. I- yeah. Islanders. Yeah. Uh, for the, or the tribe that worships Kong. So there's a, this is part of the movie where we get a little lost, I feel, in some of the plot mechanics. Because so... They get to the island. They go to the island. Or Carl actually leads them to the island. They get there. They get captured by the the tribe. 
the captain saves them. They go back to the ship only for Anne to get captured again. So they have to go back. At, so they, they're going back and forth from the ship like four times. Well, let's also be very honest. None of the men would have saved her. They'd have just got on the boat and gone home. I think so. As well. <laughs> uh, although I will say that I love that we have a sea captain who is played by um, Thomas Kretschmann, who is Baron Von Strucker in the Marvel Universe. That's right. He is. As soon as I heard his voice, I knew I recognized them. Um, so he, I was so- he is excellent in this movie he might be well we'll we'll hold that thought (laughs) Uh, well i was gonna say like we'll talk about him later (laughs) well i'm not gonna give him like the best actor in the movie and everyone in this listening you know in our movie retrospectives that what we do but i would say right now that i would say that if i were to give the underrated best actor in the Mm, movie okay it's a fight between thomas kreshman and evan park for like underrated yeah yeah yeah, yeah. like 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 actors who could have done been in a bigger part. Well, because they give Evan and Thomas some really goofy dialogue mm-hmm. beats, and both of them sell it every single time. Like, both of them are like, I know the tone of this movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know yeah, exactly yeah. the tone of this movie. I know exactly how to deal this line. Because they give the captain some dumb lines like, Don't, you can't go across that ravine. They'll kill you. And you're like, a lesser actor would have just, mm-hmm. like myself, would have blown that line out of the water. Um, okay. Let's talk about the lead up to Kong. They do a very good job, I think, in terms of the lead up of Kong, where when Naomi Watts and Darrow is offered to Kong, we do not get to see Kong fully. Mm -hmm. You get to see him like through smoke. You get to see him. And then there's a shot where after Kong grabs her, we see her POV, which I thought was excellent. Like you're seeing the camera move Mm -hmm. because it's his arms. And we don't really get to see Kong fully until she see Kong fully, which I think is an excellent, excellent choice. I also love the design update of giving Kong a giant scar by his eye, the idea that he fought some other monster. I re- it's funny, when this movie came out in 2005, I remember there being some nerd chatter on the internet mm-hmm. where people were like, Godzilla gave him that. That's from Godzilla. <laughs> you know, there was already the interconnected universe well, that they, I love. They had already fought. By yeah. Their, yeah. Yes, exactly. Um. So, Ashley, yes. what did you think about the reveal of, I think Kong shows up in hour 20 in this movie? Yeah, man. It's like <laughs> when Bucky finally shows up in Captain America colon the Winter Soldier. You're <laughs> yeah. just like about freaking time. Um, he looks great. There is a lot of CG in this movie that does not look great. Even if the CG looks like crap, Kong always looks, Kong looks great. Good. Like they spent a lot of time and a lot of care on this character model, which totally makes sense when you think about like Weta and Andy Serkis going on to do the Apes trilogy. We should mention as well, Andy Serkis is the body actor for Kong. Yes. Uh, yes. I have a lot to say about Andy Serkis. Oh, go ahead. Then. Go ahead. <laughs> I just think I like, I love the, I love to stand on the soapbox that like Andy Serkis should have 185 Academy Awards. <laughs> That's a high number. For the advances <laughs> that he has made in the art of movie making through not only his performance and making motion capture the thing, which has extended over to television, has extended into video games, um, but also for um, what his company does and their consulting. Like he has done, made such important leaps and bounds and strides for film and I think he's underrated because he makes a lot of quote unquote silly genre movies like yeah. Lord of the Rings, King Kong, he's gonna be in Batman. Like I'm every time he gets to show up in live action and, and he's plays a ridiculous character in this and is absolutely delightful mm-hmm. as Lumpy, but I'm always so glad he gets some facey time as well. But as Kong, he's so, so good and there's such a direct line uh, between Kong and Caesar. And there's a version of this movie too where Kong is not likable or empathetic and they do make him scary like he's way scarier than that puppet ever dreamed of being (laughs) yes yes um but i think it works because the tone of this movie by a contemporary consumer standard is just much darker um but i think it really i just think it works really well all the stuff with with kong even when he's whipping and darrow around and you're like well her ribs are shattered and her neck is broken whiplash um, yes i don't even mind because you come to this movie to see him punch a dinosaur in the head jeremy let's talk about the reveal of kong and kong in this movie what do you think about it um well just to back up what ashley said i do think andy circus is the best there is at what he does 
basically. And what he does is very nice. Yeah, it's very nice. Um, But he has a very particular skill set that, like... You know, lots of people do motion capture capture work and and nobody is famous for it but him. <laughs> um, and I think that he really does get to shine across both of these uh, performances. Um, but especially as Kong, this Kong does feel a lot more human, for lack of a better word, than in the original. Um, and I'm one that finds the old, you know, uh, puppet Kong charming as hell i i don't i don't typically mind stuff like that like i can get behind old doctor who i agree um, with you I, it, for that same reason yeah but. you judge oh yeah it, let, like let's put kudos on ray harryhausen for yeah, sure yeah. You, you judge it by the year it was released mm-hmm. and to be honest with you i still think it looks good because uh, to be honest with you the fact that they were able to make it look that good in 1933 is yeah. astounding well and you know and it still holds tension today mm-hmm. honestly um but but yeah the the work they did on it and i probably feel like i'm a little kinder to the cg in general in this movie than both of you guys are um there are a couple of real egregious moments but um and they mostly live in the middle third of the movie I agree uh, in the jungle um New York City is almost entirely CG and it's yes, beautiful it you yes, know they actually built um in New Zealand uh the majority of this movie is filmed in New Zealand with the exception of the theater at the end of the movie where they reveal Kong is the Pantages in Los Angeles like fully just the Pantages yeah. we, we, <laughs> we actually immediately recognized it because that's where we saw Hamilton in Los Angeles so we were like oh hey um but for the New York scenes, they actually built that fake Times Square on a sound lot in New Zealand, and then they just CG extended it. There's only one. There's only one. Uh, there's only one lot and studio in Wellington. Yes, uh, but I was going <laughs> to say with you, I agree with both your points. I do think Kong looks amazing, and I think a lot of that is the credit of Weta and Andy Circus and and Jeremy. I agree with you. I think most of the CG problems are the jungle because you can tell right away that they are on a soundstage with lots of blue screen. And the and, brontosaurus chase. Yes, and and it, it to be honest with you, for a lot of it, it makes me, it reminds me a lot of the tree sequences and the jungle sequences in Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, which came out three years after that because they did the same thing because Harrison Ford at the time, he was coming back for Indiana Jones. He was an old man, and he was like, I'm not going to a jungle. And so their only choice was to film in Los Angeles, and their jungle looks real bad as well. You can tell that they're on a soundstage for the entire time. And especially, um, I'm going to give Peter Jackson a little bit of... um. You know, slight slap on the wrist, Sir Peter. Um, love you. Come on the pod. Anyways, because New Zealand has lots of forests mm-hmm. that would easily fit in for Skull Island. He literally could have just drove down the road like two hours and found a location. Oh, no, he could have. He could have drove like a half an hour. Yes. <laughs> yeah, um, you don't have to go that far. And And this is something that he's very guilty of in the Hobbit trilogy the that post he, Lord of the Rings. The, yeah. That he yeah. makes after this, where there are many sequences in the Hobbit that I was like, why didn't you just literally walk outside the soundstage and point the camera at any mountain and put that behind your character. But instead he made a CGI mountain and, and the entirety of the Hobbit is just looking at people in front of green screens. And you're just like, this doesn't, this is not enjoyable because I know it's fake. Yeah. I mean, there's also a sequence in here where there's a log that they're all hanging off that Kong throws down a canyon, and it's sort of, um, you know, the the canyon gets more narrow, and so they get stopped and they don't all fall to their death. That is like almost beat for beat the hobbits in the middle segment riding the bridge down in the mines, and you're just like. Okay, so there's okay, so we were trying out. We had this mechanic, so we just copied this over onto the Hobbit. Now, I will say, <laughs> uh, yeah, and I want to, I want to delve down into that a little bit more. Ashley, you are a resident Lord of the Rings expert. Yes, um, that is certified here. We, uh, you know, we have the paperwork. We can back it up. So, I want to ask you. You brought that point up several times mm-hmm. during as we were watching this movie that you said you were like this. A lot of the beats and a lot of the impulses in this movie reminded you of stuff that we see Sir Peter Jackson. I don't know if he's knighted, but I'm just going to call him. He's not. Sir Peter. Um, He could be, though. He's a Commonwealth citizen. He should be. Sir Peter Jackson. Let's get that started. Hashtag release the... Yeah, come on, Lizzie. Release the Jackson uh, knight chip. 
I don't know. Is that right? <laughs> knighthood. <laughs> knighthood. <laughs> um, Americans put no respect on British knighthoods. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, I don't care. <laughs> you said that a lot of this is the impulses that you see, we see later in The Hobbit, mm-hmm. more so than the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And actually, I want to say is, do we think post Lord of the Rings, when Peter Jackson won... When Lord of the Rings, Return of the King won Best Picture, it won like 12 Oscars that year. He cleaned the Oscars. Uh, it won 11, 11, which ties with the Titanic for the most for a single motion picture. But collectively for the Lord of the Rings, he has won 13, which means he wins. Okay, so do we think from this movie on, counting King Kong mm-hmm. 2005, do we think studio, do we think we are seeing a Peter Jackson that is getting no notes, no executive over. Do you think this is Peter Jackson unfiltered? And that is the reason why, you know, the Lord of the Rings trilogy is a little bit more restrained, less goofy is because on that trilogy he had notes, but from this point forward, no notes. Well, I don't believe an executive is incapable of giving notes. Mm -hmm. So I think he probably had a lot less notes. The thing about the Lord of the Rings trilogy in particular is that each of those movies was made for like 300,000 or 300, Something um, I thought the total million? I thought the total it, I thought each one was 150. Yeah, that's what it is. It's something like that. So like it's whereas like each of the hobbits had 300. Yes. So like there's wild restrictions. And um I think I think Peter Jackson has had a similar trajectory to um notorious turf JK Rowling, where when she became famous, there were <laughs> clearly many more limited notes on her books and they got progressively less good as they went along. Um and, and I think that's what we're seeing here. But I mean, I don't have an issue with copying over assets. Like there are definitely assets in King Kong where or, or moments in King Kong where you're like, oh, this is evocative of something from Lord of the Rings. But particularly the bridge falling down and then the sequence that Jeremy alluded to earlier, the Brontosaurus chase. Um, and, and I don't mind the idea of that chase. And I actually think they take... Um, interesting opportunities to tell us a little bit more about some of the characters and how they act under that level of duress. And it turns into actually a really nice character beat for Kyle Chandler's character um, that pays off in the next act. However, it's so goofy. Nobody gets squished for like the first full minute. I was like, they're yeah. really not going to step on anybody. Yeah. But it remi- that reminded me of the barrel sequence in The Hobbit. And I think it's the tonality that I find most similar, even more than some of like the graphics or the mechanics that they're borrowing. And I get it. You have them. It's like the flash uses the same five effects that Barry Allen can do because that's what their effects house can afford to build. Like I get it. That's why we still have stupid windmill arms after all of these seasons. But King Kong has a goofiness to it um, that the Hobbit takes and ramps up to an 11 that you don't see in Lord of the Rings or you don't see in some of Peter Jackson's independent work before that. And I think it's ultimately to the detriment of the overarching narrative. And I think it's why King Kong is ultimately, I think, I think this is uh, surprising no one less successful on, on all fronts than any of the Lord of the Rings movies. Mm. Jeremy, do you have any insight? Do you have any thoughts you want to throw into that? Not, not really just because like I, I, cards on the table never saw the Hobbit movies. Um, it's just I, fantasy is less of my jam. Um, Listeners, this, I want to throw out a challenge right now to you that if you want to do hashtag GHL nope, Hobbit, stop. nope, we will make Jeremy watch nope. the. No, okay, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> not gonna one work. Of, one of them is good. Don't have that kind of time or that kind of interest. Um, <laughs> Um, but, but I will say that I think Peter Jackson is a great director. Oh, no so, doubt. Yeah. So, so for me, you know, to, to see, you know, his Lord of the Ringsified version of this story, um, it, it really works. Um, because so much of this movie, you know, the Brontosaurus chase and there's like kind of one other scene, um, Almost everything else has a root in the original of this, mm-hmm. and he just greatly expanded upon it. And he he took things that he was very clearly good at from Lord of the Rings, like like the log scene that you mentioned. It does feel Lord of the Rings esque, but th- that's also a scene in the original. It's just a lot briefer, you know. It's over in about a quarter of the time, <laughs> like it would be in real life if you think about it. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um. But yeah, I I honestly really kind of enjoy that for what it is, because since I'm not going to sit through a nine hour fantasy epic, it's nice to watch Peter Jackson do something. Let's talk about this. The main crux of the movie 
where King Kong and watches Anne Darrow pretend to juggle. Although I think she's actually juggling. We we actually watched that scene and we were curious. We're like, is that CGI rocks that Naomi? Like, is there's I some- I bet she didn't do the kick one. Yeah. Agreed. Yes. Agreed. <laughs> yeah, there's some points where like the rocks, her reaction to the rocks are, seem a little bit too light. And I was like, oh, did they just see, cause she not juggle and they CGI the rock? I don't know. Well, look, and we're not shaming. Juggling is really hard. Juggling is, is real hard. really hard. I can't so, juggle. So uh, Jeremy, I want to start with you. Do we buy that Anne Darrow in this version loves King Kong. Is that justified from the way this film presents it? Um, I I think so, just because it, more so than the original even, he he goes out of his way to save her. Um, and there is nothing resembling that moment between the two of them where she does her bit in the original. Um, it's more just like, oh, pretty lady. It's kind of all the justification you get for, like, why the original Kong has any interest in Anne. How like um, a man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very stereotypical crow mag stuff. <laughs> um, but, no, I, I think I think it works. It works well enough for what it is. You know, I never forgot what movie I was watching or anything. Um, but, yeah, I think it works. Ashley, mm-hmm. do they justify Anne's love of Kong? So... I have a uh, yes and no, in my opinion, because the word love is what I'm getting hung up on. You can change that word then. It's it's not that I want to put a different word into your question or, or give you. I'm not going to offer the professional television writer notes on his <laughs> word selection, but um, it's what it's what you think love means. Right. Like, I don't see it as romantic love. Mm hmm. Um, I don't necessarily know if that is what this movie is trying to tell us. Like, I think she loves him the way you love a dog that you know bit someone once. Okay. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yes. Or like the way you love your cat who's an asshole to everybody else. Like, I see it more like that. And I think if you if you watch the movie through that lens, it is really effective because Kong like all animals is not evil. Like he's nothing but reactive to what happens around him and he has just attached to her. I think I think the vaudeville bit is really does a really good job at explaining why he likes her. And then the moment where she stands up to him and he like throws a fit the way a toddler would, the way an ape would if if you were ever like me and have watched a lot of videos about mm-hmm. the way apes behave, that felt incredibly accurate to me. So like I I believe their love, but I don't see it as like she gonna marry him. Well, I, I want to what... chime in with that too, because yeah, like I I certainly didn't mean to put a romantic filter on top of their relationship I, with I just the word some love there. Do sometimes. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I didn't really read that into it, but but speaking specifically about the scene where she does her vaudeville bet for him, the tension in that scene is real. Yes. When he he starts pushing her over, you know, near the edge of that cliff. You really feel it. And for me, it gave me vibes from the original Frankenstein movie mm-hmm. with the little girl oh. and he's throwing the flower petals, you know, mm-hmm. um, because it, Peter Jackson for a second made me think that he was going to knock her off that cliff. Mm-hmm. And I knew what that couldn't happen, but I still movie. felt like that, you know. Yes. So I think that scene really worked for that reason. Well, I and love might have been the 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 wrong term, but I wanted to talk about it because we go from this vaudeville scene, right? Mm-hmm. And to where there is the ice skating scene. There was where they're, 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 they're scooting around on their butts in Central Park, which is my favorite scene in the entire Wherein film. Wherein she freezes to death yep. because it's yeah. below zero. But then at the end of the Empire she's State... She's still wearing nothing. Yeah, yes. yeah in when her she, slip. Yeah, when she's on top of the Empire State Building in a slip and not freezing, um, she cries. Yeah. He dies and she cries, implying... That she likes. There's this an emotional ape. attachment. Yeah, exactly, for sure. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. And he I, saved her life a bunch. That is true. Um, and he's innocent, right? Like, even though, yeah, we saw him kill a dinosaur or whatever, but like, he's not mm-hmm. hateful or bad. From, from he my, doesn't have the capacity to understand fully mm-hmm. what's happening to him. For myself, I think it works if you accept the tone of this type of movie. Uh huh. Of course. Because in reality, I don't think any human would befriend or, or, fall in love with this giant monster. I think you're in Jane Goodall is screaming into her iPhone right now. <laughs> uh, okay. Hello, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> please, Would you like to come on the podcast? <laughs> please come on the show. Would you like to come on our tenacious D pick of the destiny? <laughs> <laughs> we'll, have, we'll do it. If Jane comes, um, 
you know, because any human would look at that monster in a natural respect and be like, this thing's going to kill me, this thing's going to kill me, mm-hmm. this thing's going to kill me, at every point, even towards the end of the New York stuff. But when you buy the reality of this film, that it is an adventure film and it is a fantasy, uh, again, like, and I, I, I learned very recently that when Kong and Anne are on the ice in Central Park, that was a reshoot. And that actually, again, is my favorite. That is the it's one. A good reshoot. That is the mm-hmm. one scene in this entire film that ensures their bond. And mm-hmm. I'm so happy it's in the cut because if it wasn't in the cut of this movie, I would be at the end when she's crying. I'd be like, I don't buy it. Mm-hmm. I don't buy it. Yeah. But when they're when that amazing James Newton Howard score comes up with Anne's theme, and they're sort of like they're they're sliding around on Kong's butt and they're laughing at each other. To me. It is very much two people who have sort of been batted around by the depression era in New York Mm -hmm. and they're just, they need a laugh. It's two like very much characters that need a laugh. And that's to me is the bonding moment of those two characters. And that's why that scene is so powerful to me. Um, and um, that's why reshoots are not a bad thing. Everybody out there listening. It's actually (laughs) a good thing. I would do reshoots every time on my movie. Um, okay. Before we talk about the New York section, at the end, is there anything else either of you would like to say about Skull Island, any of the events on Skull Island besides uh, the bug sequence really freaks me out. So well done, Peter Jackson. <laughs> it, it really freaked me out, too. Well done on that. Um, oh, Sir I will Peter. Say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Sir Peter. <laughs> Sir Peter Jackson. <laughs> um, so there's a moment in, in this movie whenever Jack goes off on his own to to rescue Anne mm-hmm. and everybody else has, has left and he and Jack Black are like yelling across the canyon at each other. And and Jack Black kind of pits Kong and Adrian Brody against each other, mm-hmm. um, which really kind of makes him the Lex Luthor of this movie. And it makes Kong Batman and Jack Driscoll Superman thoughts. <laughs> um, would love to see Jack Black as Lex Luthor. Not gonna <laughs> lie. <laughs> you know, I, I would be down in the right, with the right Superman? Sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I will say this. Um, Jack Black would be a perfect Winslow shot toy man. Mm. Ah, he would be. He would be perfect for even Henry Cavill as toy man. Or even uh, Superman and Lois. He would be perfect for that. Um, but, yeah, I'd, I think you'd, he would be an interesting Lex Luthor. Yeah. No, this, this, was, the, this was the thing where... And I've never not thought that Jack Black was a good actor. I've always enjoyed Jack Black. I think he's very yeah. funny. I think he's very talented. But this rewatching this, I was like, yeah, Jack Black is a good actor. Yeah. And a lot of people just like shuffle him off to the side to be like, oh, he's the goofy funny weed. guy. He's yeah. funny weed guy. And yeah. I'm like, no, this this movie proves that like when Jack Black like brings his A game, he's excellent. Yeah. yeah, I mean, give him an Orson Welles biopic that ends with him doing that uh, wine commercial where he's visibly drunk and angry at the <laughs> end. <laughs> I would love to see it. Oh, man. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about, we come back to New York, right, and he becomes Kong, the eighth wonder of the world, which is a really good that they film at the Pantages, which is really um, one of the smartest script beats that I love in this movie, I think is an excellent piece of writing, is the reveal where... Um, And they do this excellently in editing because we see a shot of Naomi Watts in a dressing room. Then we Mm -hmm. cut to the stage and then the lady comes up from under the stage. She's blonde. Even Kong thinks it's Anne and she lifts her head and it's not Anne. And then we cut to Anne is just in some schlocky dance number at some community theater down the street. She's one of a billion. I thought that was such a clever story twist. So I tried to confirm this. I couldn't confirm it, but I really hope whoever played stage Anne I really hope that's just Naomi Watts' stand-in. Oh, interesting. Because that would be, um, you know, that's a featured background part, so you get you get a little bump. She's making a couple hundred bucks a day, but I was like, what a nice way to highlight the lady who has been here for all the light focusing. Actually, <laughs> Naomi time. Watts' stand-in is in this movie, but she played a different part. <gasps> Do you know she, who? She plays Naomi Watts' character in the play that Jack Driscoll wrote. At the end, when he's watching, oh, that's, that's Naomi so Watts' cool. stand-in playing that role. That's a cover. Um, but that is the scene that I alluded to earlier that I said was truly, truly dumb for Adrian Brody. Yes, I agree. Because he he wrote that play for her. So he wrote those words after he met her. But then 
sits in the theater and watches it and it has some sort of impact as though he wasn't already aware of it. And that's the thing that spurs him to get up and leave. That theater is also way too modern for 1933. Like yeah. that is like a 19... 19- 40 sorry 1950s or 60s like classic new york's black box <laughs> so yeah whatever it's it's and it's a thing where it's like the execution of it would be dumb even if it were necessary mm-hmm. but it's also not necessary okay so then the movie gets to the climactic kong uh running around new york he finds naomi watts they climb up the Empire State Building and she runs like fifty blocks uptown to find. She does and they do some in high heels. Well, uh, so funny. It's a fun fact, right? Kong rampages through New York, um, and we're going to do a little fun trivia bit here um, by looking at the IMDb trivia. Uh, according to IMDb trivia, Kong in this movie kills forty-one people throughout the entire runtime of the film. I mean, at least. <laughs> <laughs> that's only one more person than he killed in 1933's King Kong. <laughs> I think that's I think that's the death toll total, not just the ones Kong is responsible for. Uh, well, it could be. I don't know. Uh, also, it says claims that, that Kong is only in 42 minutes of the movie. That, that feels sounds accurate right. to me. Yeah. yeah. Um, so they climb up the Empire State Building. I think another great, bil- brilliant piece of Andy Circus acting, and I put this all on Andy Circus, is the idea that he mimics her beautiful sign. Mm-hmm. And he oh, thinks that's that such a great moment. He thinks Dawn coming up on New York looks right. And, and this, Which, is by the, the way, is not sign language for beautiful. No. It's just a thing that they made up. It's yeah. fully not like apes are capable of learning sign language. Well, let's, but... let, let's be honest here. Um, and I don't honestly know the answer to this. Um, was would a 1933 actress know sign language? I don't know how educated is she. <laughs> you know, um, I mean, American sign language was existed has existed since America has existed. Yeah, so I don't know. I don't know whether you know. I, that, I mean, probably not. But it would have. I I don't know. I just thought it would have been a nice moment. <laughs> well, they have. I agree. They should have just done it. They should, they should have just yeah, made it yeah, the same yeah, symbol. Yeah. But it's still a great beat. And um, again, everything in old timey New York looks fantastic because. It's, it's the trick with CGI, right? A computer can make hard lines and right angles till the cows come home. But when you have to do organic shapes, that's when it starts getting funky. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. everything in New York and all those shots and, and the whole, the planes attacking them all were fantastic. By the way- they also, um, But they also would have had incredible reference for that, right? They're not trying to build something oh, they brand have, new. They would have so yeah. many uh, references to that. By the way, this is where we get- our most cameos in the entire film. Uh, Rick Baker, famous CGI, uh, not CGI, but famous special effects artist, um, is the pilot that is shooting at Kong in the Empire State Building, but he shaved his beard. Peter Jackson is one of the gunners. Mm -hmm. He also shaved his beard. And Frank Darabont, famous Shawshank Redemption director, Frank Darabont, is also one of the gunners as well. Nice. Yeah. Um, Actually, Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the finale of this movie. Yeah. Um, you know, Kong gets shot at a lot. It's a miracle that Ann Darrow also didn't go down in a hail of 50, uh, 50 caliber bullet gunfire. That's true. Um, they, she definitely would have died. It's also a miracle she didn't just get blown over by a stiff breeze up there. That's, that's also very fair. Um, I mean, I actually, you and I have been to the top of that building. It's, it's very windy. windy. It is yeah. very windy. And she goes to the top. The tippity top. The tippity top with no handrails. Yeah. Um, she's not cold. And uh, she's fine. I actually love the end of this movie. And I do think the ending of this movie, especially all the way into the end of uh, It Truly Was Beauty That Killed the Beast. I mean, when Kong dies in this movie, I think it's successful. I I think you feel Mm -hmm. it. You Mm -hmm. really feel sorry for this giant monster. And uh, to be honest with you, as soon as they get to the island on... I like this movie. Yeah, it should have started on um, the island. Yes, exactly. <laughs> or should have started on a boat five minutes away from the island. But what do you think about the whole Empire State Building? What stands out to you? What's successful? What's not? Uh, I think the whole I think that whole sequence is incredibly successful, even though we know because it's been parodied to literal death and yes. back again, what is going to happen. Um, it's really well rendered. The CG looks great. The thing that gets me is Kong takes quite a few bullets, but there's one point where you can tell by the sound that Andy Serkis makes that it has punctured his lung. Oh, And then he starts to physically collapse after that point. And like, it makes me really sad. Yeah, And I thought it was like very, very arresting. Um, And then I thought, you know, he falls, was not as gruesome as it should have been, but I get it. This is like a PG-13 movie. Um, And then 
Halle Berry's assaulter climbs up to see if Andero's okay, and I in my brain kept being like, just push him off. Just push him off the building. Just push him off the building. <laughs> uh, fun fact for everybody, also according to the trivia, apparently Kong's roar is a lion's roar played backwards. Interesting. It's yes. definitely, and slowed down. It's definitely some of the dinosaur sounds are definitely recycled Oliphant oh, sounds. Oh, 100%. 100%. Uh, Jeremy, what do you think about the big Empire Strikes Back climb up? Empire Strikes Back. The Empire Strikes Back. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> it's probably the best Star Wars movie. <laughs> uh, so, Jeremy, do we believe that Lando would have betrayed C-3PO and crew? Let me Let's just talk about this. Would Lando betray C-3PO? Absolutely. <laughs> Why does Lando care about C-3PO? <laughs> did they, did no, they actually, establish some sort of relationship in the prequel that I missed? When Anne Darrow gets her lightsaber in Return of the Jedi, mm -hmm. uh, how impactful is that moment? Uh, well, you're forgetting that uh, this is misogyny and no woman gets a lightsaber in the original Star Wars movie trilogy. That's <laughs> <Snaps> for that. <laughs> All right, Jeremy. When the Kong strikes back, <laughs> what do we think about the Empire? The Empire State building uh, sequence. I, I, I think I think it works and I think it works like Ashley said because of Andy Circus. Uh that that moment feels very real when he takes that hail of bullets to the back. Um protecting her, really. Um it it really works. And yeah, like it's it's not that gruesome, you know, the fall, but um it's th that's actually a a fun fact about the original. They weren't able to get the fall shot that they wanted to of him. Um, so Peter Jackson like built this one kind of around the way that they originally intended to do it, um, which I thought was interesting. But yeah, it, it really worked for me. M most of my problems in this movie, honestly, you guys said you would take out the New York stuff at the beginning and start in the jungle. I like the New York stuff. I'd make the jungle shorter. Oh, I would. Um, I mean, I would cut a lot of this movie in the jungle as well. Yeah. Like my my issues with this are similar to um, some of my issues with uh, the Zack Snyder's Justice League. Because I'm like, all of the scenes have good stuff in them, but they are so long. I, I <laughs> yes. agree. I agree. I if I were to if you know we're talking about problems of this movie because I am positive on this movie. I actually think it's really good. Um, it's just it, it could have been great. And yeah. it's so close to being great. And I think mm -hmm. I, I I think the biggest problem with this movie is pace. It really is pace because this movie really works in the last third. It, the the new when Kong is in New York, that is when this movie is firing on all cylinders. Yeah. And I think the opening New York bits, cut that in half. The jungle bits, cut that in half. Get to Kong in New York as soon as possible. Um I, I've always said this for you, like this movie, the theatrical cut, I think is like three hours and five minutes. I've always said that I thought that there was an excellent, like two hour, 15 minute cut mm -hmm. of this movie. Agreed. Like you cut 45 minutes off this movie and I think it's fantastic. Well, this is a similar thing that you and I were talking about with Godzilla and how Godzilla movies keep getting longer. And you're like a big dumb monster movie, really like a tight 90 minutes. 90 is, is minutes. Good. Yeah. It's, it's like enough. Well, because there's only so far you can stretch the credibility when, when you're just like, when well, one of them isn't human. Well, yeah. <laughs> yes, and also because I always feel that once you get to the 90 minute mark of a big kaiju movie, because mm -hmm. this is a kaiju movie, Absolutely. basically, mm -hmm. is the humans become secondary characters. Mm -hmm. And you cannot, you can't, um, I'm trying to come up with a word here and I can't pull it. You, you cannot sympathize with a giant monster who doesn't speak English for longer or than whatever, 90 minutes. Whatever language you're watching yeah. the movie. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. <laughs> oh, sorry, whatever language. But a non-talking, mm -hmm. a non-dialogue mm -hmm. talking character. Once you hit the 90 minute mark, it's the point of like, are we done yet? Because you realize that the characters that do talk are meaningless to the story. Yeah, yeah. That it is Kong ex story. Exposition machine. Exactly. Yeah. Their exposition means to set up the next disaster. Or Godzilla is the same thing. And I think this movie does a pretty good job of getting around that because of all his interactions with um, Naomi Watts. But also, this movie has the problem that every time we cut away from Kong, you're like, I don't care. Yeah, I yeah, don't yeah. care. Go yeah. back to Kong. But also, like, the most beautiful moments visually of this movie have to deal with Kong. It's every time he's sitting against the skyline yep. with Anne are beautifully rendered. Um, and uh, also, special shout out to the designers for making him a silverback. That's like a great detail yep. that I don't know if everyone would have thought about. Is he a silverback in uh, Kong versus Godzilla? 
We, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> yeah, I, don't know. I don't know. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, any final thoughts that we did not talk about? Um, I open the floor to Jeremy or Ashley. Uh, Ashley, would you like to start? Any final thoughts on that we didn't talk about that you would like to bring up about Kong? King Kong. King Kong colon Skull Island. The Empire Strikes Kong. Uh, uh, no, because everything I still want to say about it, I think is going to be best served in our wrap up portion. So I yield my time. I give my time back to the room. I got something. I think this movie could use about three more really big action set pieces crammed in there somehow. (laughs) Um, okay. Pitch it. Jeremy, you're going to have to pitch one of them. Let's hear it. Pitch, pitch me the one most necessary action sequence that you need to shove in here. Um, no, I'm, I'm being facetious. Um, All right, I'm putting I, it in it, here. If there anything, I would have trimmed. the galley of the ship. <laughs> there is a fight in the galley of the ship. There needs to be another one. <laughs> because I need more time with Andy Serkis and Lumpy. I mean, true. Lumpy is the secret hero of this movie. Lumpy is his audition piece uh, for Captain Haddock. Yes, as, uh, I mean, Tintin. very much, yeah. He gets such a, a raw death, too. It sucks. I, you know, I'm going to say this. I think this movie doesn't need the romantic subplot between the humans. Absolutely not. I think this movie should, again, just had the only love triangle that should have been in this movie should have been Kong between Carl Denham and Kong between Ann Darrow. That is the only three characters we should have ever focused on. And fun fact, I I looked on the IMDb Pro uh, uh, trivia here. Sir Ian McKellen was offered the role of Carl Denham, and he could not do it because he was in a play in London. Now, I think Serene... Was he in Bent at the time? Who knows? I think Serene McKellen would have been completely miscast for Carl Denham. It would have been a very different... um, We would have been parodying a very different director. Yes, exactly. Um, But yeah, I, I... Yeah, I... I think the romantic subplot does not work in this movie, and I think that's the biggest falling of this movie, and I also think that... I guess I'm willing to forgive that because, like, it's a 50-50 whether the romantic plot ever works in a movie. And most action movies shoves one in there yeah. as well. Yeah. I yeah. mean, there's one in uh, your all-time favorite Vin Diesel movie, Bloodsport or whatever the hell that thing is called. That is uh, that is slander <laughs> and lies, <laughs> and uh, my lawyer will be contacting you immediately. <laughs> yeah, All right. I felt wrong hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Jeremy, we're going to start us off all our movie retrospectives. We ask everybody who we think is the best actor, who's the most successful actor in this movie. Um, Jeremy, who do you think gives the best performance in King Kong 2005? I'm gonna I'm gonna honorable mention you guys first a bit. So sure. I, I you think, think it's that. me. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I really think that Thomas Kretschmann does a great job for for oh, yeah. what's not on the page. Um, he is low key one of the best actors in this movie. I. I want to shout out Naomi Watts. I'm not giving it to her, but I think that she does a good job. I think that she, you know, isn't even that much more fully drawn than the original Andero was, um, but she makes it work. Honestly, it came down to Evan Park and Jack Black for me, just because uh, Evan Park's character is the skipper of the ship. Shouldn't there's not much there. He really breathes life into that character and he does such a good job with it. And honestly, he is the person I cared about the most as I was watching the movie. But I have to say Jack Black is the best actor um, just because he really breathes life into that role. And there are a couple of moments in the movie when everybody is terrified and he's rolling the camera and he's dead eyed. And, and it works for me. Like, I think he really found the core of who that character is um, because he is the antagonist of the movie. His greed drives everything forward and he just becomes a, a vacuum at some point and he really sells it and it works for me. So I've got to give it to Jack Black. Ashley, mm-hmm. who is the best actor in King Kong 2005? Um, I am going to give it to Andy Serkis. Ah. Because... Andy Serkis brings, like, I don't know how that man's body isn't in shambles by the sheer amount of physical work that he, like, I want to know what his yoga routine is. <laughs> I want to know how he stretches. I want to know what his diet is because the if you've ever watched any of the behind the scenes on any movie he's ever worked on, 
It's not just a dude kind of bent over, kind of doing an ape impression. Like he fully walks the way a gorilla walks, which is not the way humans walk. Actually it is, because there's been a couple that have made those evolutionary steps. Go check out those videos. They're very, very cool and they will inherit this earth. But I don't think this movie would be even worth discussing if he were not as good as he is. And my favorite Kong moment in the whole movie is when he kills the dinosaur and then plays with its broken jaw. Which was an improv. Yeah. Which is disgusting mm-hmm. and 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 frightening, but also absolutely what an ape would what an animal would mm-hmm. do. Like I, I just thought it was such a cool beat. It was and, totally radical. And and it's that thing that Jason had, and told me that that was an improvised thing, and apparently it was controversial at the time. Mm-hmm. And I was like, they thought it was. They there was some talk about taking it out of the movie because they thought it made Kong too mean. No, it's so good. So I mean, there are. There are definitely better human performances. Mm-hmm. I think I think Jeremy's like right on with who the top two are, but I, in good conscience, one have to give it to a Lord of the Rings actor, which pretty much means it has to be Andy Serkis. <laughs> so Jason, <laughs> who did you think was the best actor in the movie? Well, I we gotta I do want to give a couple honorable mentions as well. Naomi Watts does do a lot of heavy lifting with her eyes, and so she does do a great performance, but she's not the best actor in this movie. Uh, this might be Jack Black's best performance of his entire career. Now, I I just did a quick glance over his IMDb. It's hard because I haven't burnt. He's also excellent in Bernie, which is a great movie if you haven't seen it as well. And um, it's hard to see which, but he's so good in this movie. He will always be that dude in high fidelity for me though. <laughs> um, well, th- that's the reason why I give it to them because yeah, this yeah, is yeah, not yeah. him just playing himself. Absolutely. Um, he's excellent in School of Rock as well, but he's just playing Jack Black, the Jack Black that we know. But I have to agree with Ashley. It is Andy Serkis. Woo, it I'm is right. calm. Because every- That was a real roller coaster. <laughs> every time we're not on Kong, I think the movie suffers. And that is only because, I mean, it's the same thing he brought to Gollum, man. It's the reason why Andy Serkis, it's the reason why the the new Planet of the Apes, the Planet of the Apes trilogy, the prequel trilogy is astounding. Those movies are fantastic. And it's because of Andy Serkis. So, and Ashley is exactly correct. Andy Serkis should have 187 Oscars. I, I <laughs> Okay. Mr. Jeremy, what do you think is, the legacy of this movie and what do you think is the overall theme of this movie looking at it 16 years later? I I think the legacy of this movie ultimately is just going to be keeping Kong in the consciousness. Um, Cause I, I feel like the um, what's, what's the word for it? The monster verse. Is that what it's called? Uh, who knows? <laughs> Whatever that is. I think that's going to, you know, be carrying that character forward in the future. But we had, you know, very little between 1976 and now outside of this movie. Um, I, I think that'll be the ultimate legacy. I don't think that this movie is, I mean, it's certainly better than the original in terms of, you know, our standards today as a movie going audience. But like, if I watch these two movies side by side, which I pretty much did, I think I got more satisfaction per minute out of the original. So I think I don't want to diminish it, but that's about as much credit as I'm willing to give to the legacy of this movie. Ashley, what do you think is the legacy or the theme of this movie? Um, It's interesting. I think Jeremy actually did a really good job summing it up because unfortunately, I think a lot of people look at this as Peter Jackson's first failure because it didn't do what Lord of the Rings did. And it wasn't a monster box office. Absolutely. And I I don't think that is the correct way to look. This movie is way better than I thought it was going to be. Like I actually had a good time watching it. I know we're going to get to the ratings and stuff like that. Um, And I think in terms of like theme and message, I think it's very similar to... The original King Kong, which honestly is very similar to Godzilla, which is like, don't play God, leave the natural, respect the natural world and leave it alone. Um, And it, through a goofy lens, examines the sort of interfacing between our natural and industrial worlds and holds the mirror up to nature, which is what all good art is supposed to do, which is why they made a sequel to it some decades after it was originally made. So I think in terms of theme, it's very similar to the original. And then maybe like, I don't know, pay Andy Serkis more money because he's really good at motion capture. <laughs> yeah. Jason, 
Morals, meanings, messages, themes? I think there's an interesting theme in this movie that is very subtle and might tell you how Peter Jackson views the world. Juggling. This this movie, and you have to realize that because, okay, I know that Beauty Killed the Beast comes from the 1933 movie, but the 1933 movie was very influential on young Peter Jackson and mm-hmm. I think imprinted on his brain. And there is a lot of beats in this movie that the female, the woman, is more dangerous than any of the men with guns. I mean, isn't that how men think about women? <laughs> well, mm-hmm. no, nah, I mean, not not me personally, but like, I think Peter Jackson- You need to be more fearful. <laughs> I, I, I think Peter Jackson definitely mm. thinks that way because there are some subtle interests. That is an interesting way to look at the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's an interesting theme to put under your monster movie. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is generally a very uh, macho and explosion and mm-hmm. all the buildings, you know, are crumbling down. Um but this is a very soft monster movie. Um, I think this movie held up way better than I thought it was going to. Mm-hmm. Um, Agreed. A hundred percent. This movie. Uh, I did enjoy rewatching this. I don't know if I'm gonna rewatch it ever again. But Probably that's not. fair. That's but, totally fair. But this, I did enjoy revisiting this movie. But um, I would say that with. I, I think the legacy of this movie is this is a movie that was purely an indulgence mm-hmm. of Peter Jackson. Yes. And I think you can see that in every frame. And I think the indulgence killed is the, the beast is, is, is the, what killed this movie mm. or what, what, yeah. what stopped this or what movie. kept it from greatness. Yeah. I, what kept know, it from greatness. Well, there are always, there's always the thing where they always say like, don't work on what you love. Like if you like, like let's put, put it out there. We're, you know, I said empire strikes back earlier. If you like, if Star Wars is your number one thing, there is that idea that like you should never work on Star Wars because you're too close to it. That being said, anyone from the casting team of the Amazon Lord of the Rings series can reach out to me at any time. (laughs) (laughs) Fair. Fair. Uh, um, Jack Black, do you know anybody over there? (laughs) We know you listen. Jane Goodall. (laughs) Um, Jane Goodall, give us a text. Um, And I think, I think he's, I think he was too close to this. I think he was way too close to this mm-hmm. one. And I think it's the reason why I think give this story to a different director. And I think they would have made a, a, a better and a more entertaining update of this. But um, I will say, you know, we would not have Kong versus Godzilla if it wasn't for this movie. Yeah. Or like, Kong Skull Island. Or Kong's we, like this. You, Jeremy's Jason, Jason and I are. Very pro Kong Skull Island. Kong Skull Island it's a is, great movie. It's, it's my favorite Kong movie, it's, honestly. It's my yes, favorite Kong yeah. movie, too. Look, I did some soft Googling. I know I said that at the very beginning that most, if you look in terms of critical darling, this is kind of the King Kong that everybody talks. Is it this one? Mm-hmm. Um, and well, I, this is the most, dare I say, filmic yeah. King it, Kong movie. It's also the most Oscar baity. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. For, <laughs> of, for sure. Of the King yeah, Kong yeah. movies. So that's, uh, stay away from my Twitter, everybody. Anyways, uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's go to ratings. Of course, we rate every movie on a scale of one to five. Bregos, the GHL intern cat, five being the best, one being the worst. Jeremy, what do you give out of a scale of Bregos, King Kong 2005? Or as some like to call it, The Empire Strikes Kong. <laughs> uh, so yeah, since it was you know way too short and could have used about three more action set pieces, right? Um, <laughs> I agree. Maybe a couple more um, actors too. But no, re- realistically, I give this movie three out of five Bregos. Um, I I think that like you don't even necessarily need a different director, same director. You just need a cold eyed editor to walk into this movie and shave about thirty or forty five minutes off, and I think it's like actually really great. Nice. Um, so yeah, just it gets in its own way is the problem. So three out of five for me. Uh, I believe uh, Peter had the final edit or final cut. Uh, I believe it. You no no <laughs> yeah well right <laughs> that, that is correct. We did look this up. Um, part of his deal for making this movie was that he had final cut of the movie. Yeah. So um, Ashley. Yes. On a scale of Bregos, what do you give King Kong 2005? Uh, I am also going to once again agree with Jeremy, and I'm going to give it three out of five Bregos. Um, And that is a little bit bumped up because I enjoy, I thought watching this movie was going to be a chore. 
And it was not. It was really slow in the beginning, in my opinion. But once we got to the island, I was like, oh, that's a pretty good movie. Okay. People are pretty good at it. The CG is pretty okay. Boy, this is long. But I'm having, I did not fall asleep like I did during Zack Snyder's Justice League. So, like, that's a pretty. Stay away from Ashley's Twitter, everybody. Low bar. I mean, I tweeted it and people already yelled at me for it. So, um so, uh, yeah, I'm going to give it three out of five Bregos. I would say if you're interested in it, it's definitely worth checking out. Rent it on Amazon. It's worth the three ninety nine. dollars um, But is it the best King Kong movie? No. No. <laughs> no. But I have not seen the original, so I can't speak to its um, how it works in comparison to that. But I think in comparison to Kong Skull Island, it's the second best King Kong movie. Well, I'm going to say when we see Godzilla versus Kong, because at the time of this recording, we have not seen it. And when King Kong stomps that lizard silly. Hondo P. That will be the best King Kong movie. Well, don't look at the action figures because they're going to spoil a lot of that for you, friends. That's true. That is true. There have been some spoilers out in the action figures. Um, By the way, it's so interesting. I uh, This has nothing to do with my rating, but I saw a... a, um, post that was like the United States Mm -hmm. and I don't know whoever whoever in the marketing team of is Warner Brothers who made Godzilla versus Kong they apparently pulled the states or looked at the Twitter tags for like Team Kong and Uh Team Godzilla and it's interesting because most of the Midwest is Team Kong but where you and I are actually in California is a hundred percent team Godzilla. Well, we're the worst closest you can get to Japan besides Hawaii. (laughs) Um, Speaking of Kong 2005 yeah, what's your rating? I'm giving it 2.5 out of 5. I'm giving which, it a lower which rating. Which 0.5? Front uh, 0.5 or back 0.5? The back 0.5. <laughs> um, I think there are, and it's so interesting because it, it is, and I'm sorry, everybody, we keep bringing up Zack Snyder's Justice League, but it's hard. It's not, in the zeitgeist, and it's also so long. Well, it's hard not to look at these movies as sort of comparable, you know, yeah. because they're both sort of, director's indulgences and it's very hard not to see either one and not to see like the filmmaker actually touching the film and actually touching the edit and i saw a lot of that in king kong yeah and i they're both great examples of why film should really be a collaborative process i i agree i agree yes because i don't agree with the film auteur theory um and from watching this film uh sir peter I think you're very, I think you're very talented. I think I would love to work with you someday, but um, I don't think I agree with Jeremy. I I don't think you should have final cut of your movies. I really don't think you should, because I think that's where all the weaknesses of this movie come in. And, and the, as a person who has done film editing before, um, that's where, that's what bumps this down to 0.5 for me is, I was looking at a lot of this movie from the editor's eye and being like, oh, get rid of that, get rid of that, get rid of that. And um, that right, not- as someone who w- has formerly worked as an editor. <laughs> yes, yes, I don't work as an editor now. Um, fun fact, I want to talk about, before we uh, end this podcast, um, another cool piece of trivia is apparently on April Fool's Day 2005, before this movie came out, Peter Jackson posted an elaborate practical joke because he did a web diary for this movie. And he revealed, before the movie even released, on April 1st, that they were starting production on King Kong, Son of Kong, and King Kong Into the Wolf's Lair. And he said that both films were going to release in 2006 and contained the principal characters of Kong 2005, riding Son of Kong, strapping machine guns to their back, and fighting Adolf Hitler's genetically mutated creatures. Ooh, 20 out of 10, though, would have watched. I kind of wish both those movies had happened. (laughs) I remember when that happened, actually. Oh, yeah? (laughs) Yeah. That was a, that's a great, uh, that's a great trick, Sir Peter. Great trick. All right, uh, let's move into the recommended reading. Ashley, what's that? That is where if you go over to geekhistorylesson.com slash recommended reading and you click on our little Amazon widgets, they will bring you to more King Kong content in case you need more after listening to this episode. Yeah, so if you go over there, we're going to have, of course, uh, uh, this version of the movie. We're going to have the 1933 version of the movie and a couple cool King Kong books. So go check that out. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast on Apple and Spotify and Stitcher and all the places you can listen to podcasts. Leave us a five star review as well. If you like to do that, helps other listeners find us. Uh, Jeremy, where can they find you 
online in case they're interested in some more of your hot Kong takes. <laughs> they can find me on Twitter at JL Awesome, but really they should go to patreon.com slash Jawin to find me on the Justice League podcast. What a segue, Jeremy, because <laughs> as always, I was going to say to everybody, you can support this podcast over at patreon.com slash Jawin, where you can hear two episodes a month of Jason and Jeremy John about Justice League. Also, every month we do an episode of Jason and Ashley's Excellent Adventures where Ashley and I get personal. And we also do Geek History Lesson Extra with every episode of Geek History Lesson. And this week, we're going to be talking with Jeremy Moore about our favorite monsters in media. Hell yeah. And so that's going to be a very interesting conversation if you want to come over there and uh, listen to that. All right. Hashtag stick around the final part of the podcast where we make sure you stuck through the plugs. I revealed my favorite scene in Kong 2005. I said it was the ice skating scene. Ashley, mm-hmm. what's your favorite? What was your favorite scene in this movie? I really like the scene when they are on the island, and it's kind of the first soft scene between Kong and Anne. It's not the vaudeville scene, but it's where he is in a full lotus position on the Pride Rock, watching the sunset. And he puts out his hand and she comes and sits with him. I just think it's so beautiful. And I think uh, some of the best acting doesn't involve lines and doesn't involve big set pieces. It's those quiet human moments. And I think it is the most human moment uh, in a movie involving a 250 foot tall CGI ape. Well said. I like Thank that. You. Jeremy, what was your favorite scene in this movie? Um, it's probably a tie between the vaudeville scene with Kong um, and the scene that um, Evan Park narrates um, oh, yeah. as their as their the kind of montage of them traveling to the island. Um, and I think he's quoting Heart of Darkness, I believe. I think you're correct. <clears throat> because yeah. that's what Jimmy has read that he has possibly stolen from the New yeah. York Public Library. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't steal books from a library. They're free. Everybody. Also, steal something better than Heart of Darkness. Yeah, steal well, something I mean, like to be cancer. fair, it was Tropic very relevant cancer? to the situation. <laughs> Wow. Of- Steal actual Did you just watch Seinfeld or something? That was a Seinfeld <laughs> joke, everybody. It was a Seinfeld joke. I mean, it's a great book, but it is. It is for adults only. <laughs> We're going to put Trap of Cancer Seinfeld in recommended Corner. reading. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that is it for this podcast. Jeremy, thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Geek Hesh Lesson. Thank you for having me, guys. It's always a pleasure. And it's always a pleasure having you on any podcast. And also, it's a pleasure having all you listeners. Thank you so much for listening to Geek Hesh Lesson every single week. I am Jason Confuses Star Wars with Kong Inman. I am Ashley Victoria Robinson and Professor Jason. Would you please dismiss the class? Ooh, ah, 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 ah. That's Kong for this class has been dismissed.